It is now time for our final session of the day with our panelist discussion. And here to introduce is the lovely Susan Turnable. I'm going to ask my colleagues to present themselves. There they are. And we're just going to quickly introduce ourselves and then we'll talk a bit about what we're going to talk about um, for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I, as you've just heard, work for a very advanced technical company. And I have to say, for me personally, um, COVID and the virtual world have really not impacted the way in which we do business. I'm really fortunate, I think, in terms of both my own role and um, the people around me. I think my greatest challenge so far, as I'm sure it is with many of you, is being able to keep in touch with my with my family. And I think in 30 years of HR experience, um, I certainly have never seen something quite like this. Certainly something that was not created by a commercial decision, but instead created by you know forces greater than, than any of us. Um, Amanda, I'm not sure what your thoughts are and if you'd like to say hi to. Yep, absolutely. So I'm Amanda, Amanda Zaringer. I'm head of learning and development at Firm Wallace. And so I'm based in Dublin, which is interesting because also for my accent, uh, I'm English. And so I've got that, uh, I've always kind of got a dual thing going on in that I go through things here. We're very much still on lockdown and there's a flat roadmap. And then I hear from my family and friends in London. And before I was at Firm Wallace, I was at MUFG Investor Services. And I was global director of LND there. So I've still got an awful lot of connections. And so I'm friends there. So seeing their global strategy and the challenges and opportunities is super interesting as well. So I'm very fortunate in that I've got that blend of learning and development and people's strategy background. And I was also a corporate lawyer as well. So I'm able to, in, in the moment, bring together that developmental people strategy and return on investment piece to really try and help us power through and look at this scenario right now. Uh, professionally, I joined Firm Water six months ago, so we had the most beautiful learning and development roadmap with our resourcing, our investment, and our medium and long-term programs. And what we've had to do, which I'm sure we're all doing, is be agile and instantly go, what can we deliver right now that will help our people and help our performance and help our business? So that's been a really quick and incredible shift and the way the team has come together is second to none. Very similarly, personally, not to be able to see family and friends who are all over the world is a real challenge. Um, so that's that's really tricky and all of our people are having different experiences right now. So I feel for everyone out there. Anthony, I think you can give us a hint of what life is like in, in France, can't you? Yes, I can. Thanks so much. So, um, currently, I'm um, Anthony Parker. I'm the VP for our Global Talent and Acquisition and Mobility for Dior. So, yes, I'm based here in Paris, France. Um, and it's seeing, overseeing about 7,000 employees, both retail and corporate. Um, and that's everything from aligning our recruitment strategies in local markets, um, executive search, college relations, diversity, inclusion, internal mobility. Um, and as you can hear, um, I'm American, I'm not French, so it's been interesting uh, being here, originally from um, Chicago and New York, where I spent the last, I don't know, about 15 years in recruitment and talent acquisition. Also interesting, I just spent the last year and a half with uh, Moet Hennessy in Hong Kong, so overseeing our APAC talent acquisition development again with our people, so about 1,400 em employees in 15 countries. Um, you know, interesting, so now that I have this global perspective, even though that I'm responsible for talent acquisition, right now the roles and responsibility have been shifted to where now I'm on a global uh, re-entry task force, so looking at our policy and our people uh, across the globe. And yet another international accent we're about to hear. Fiona, would you like to say hello too? It's only Irish. <laughs> um, so I'm also based in Dublin. And um, I actually work for myself, but I spent about 17 years working in HR, change and professional services, working in a variety of different companies. But I set up my own business four years ago. And I, uh, prior to setting up my own business, I actually worked in a 100% virtual organization. So we were 100% virtual for five years. So I totally get the whole thing that everyone is, is kind of, you know, working with at the moment. And when I was working in that organization, I was doing a master's in occupational psychology 
and work behavior. And I did my thesis on virtual working and the effects it has on relationships and areas of trust, professional isolation, personalities and communication, autonomy, all those lovely pieces. So now I do an awful lot of work around that, especially in the last eight to nine weeks. And I am. Um, I'm also an executive coach focusing on empowerment and motivation. And I do a lot of executive education and corporate training on all sorts of things from leadership to future of work to work behavior. And now at the moment, a lot on virtual working. So as you can see, a real varied panel. Um, topics that we thought we'd pick up given this, this new world, this new state of change were first of all the impact it may be having on HR practices, so the things that we've taken for granted, have they altered or changed, and how agile have organisations been to meet that change. We're going to have a look at this professional isolation, lovely to have Fiona with us who can talk to us in a bit more detail around that concept and what that actually means and the impact it may have on you as an HR professional and of course the colleagues that you, you work with. We then thought we'd go on and have a little look at well-being and just talk a bit about the things that we've seen in our organisations implement um, while we've gone through this recent bout of change and indeed other things that we've seen previously because change is a constant. That's the one thing we can say, can't we, about change. And then finally, we thought we'd move on to talk a little bit more about employee engagement. How do you maintain that engagement level and how do you make sure you continue to invest even if commercially your organization may be struggling um because that's the reality as we know from some of the unemployment figures that we're hearing around around the globe okay so let's start with good old hr practice i'm going to ask anthony who i think has probably got the most relevant experience given that 7000 workforce that you that you have perhaps just talk to us a little bit about the hr practices that you've put in place since the lockdown has has begun yeah. You know, you know, I wanted to really start this off by first mentioning kind of two disclaimers, you know, when reviewing and developing these new policies and best practices during this pandemic of COVID-19, it's really important for HR business leaders and uh, senior leaderships in the organizations to partner with your in-house legal team. And if you don't have a legal team, it's always best to look external in developing these new and unchartered kind of times. Um, the other piece is that, you know, in developing these new policies, it's really important to kind of adhere to your local uh, government and local laws as well as your employee contracts for each individual group or group of individuals that you're working for, because they do vary geographic location by location. And last but not least, is try to avoid biases, discrimination, and exclusion. So it's just three policies I want to talk about really quickly that seem to be pretty consistent across all organizations. And one is kind of the leave of absence. Um, question now is what happens if an employee becomes uh, sick or infected with COVID-19? What type of leave of absence are they allowed to take? Is it sick time? Is it short-term disability? Long-term, are we asking our employees to take their paid time off or their vacation time? Um, then also the second question and the new policy that we're looking at is the leave for care for someone who's affected by COVID-19. And where does that fall into our policies? Um, I know for the U.S., it could fall underneath what we have is our FMLA, our Family Medical Leave Act. But we want to be sure that we communicate these clear new leave policies, um, really clear, consistent and effective. And the last core group is caring for an elderly or a child, um, you know, while we're in this quarantine space and what type of policy do we have to address that? Um, the other policy which has become interesting is now this re-entry to the workforce, right? Um, our organization, as many others, we're starting to deal with what we, we call these global re-entry task force. So it's a combination of an HR profession, senior leaders from different functions of the organizations and again your legal team to really help develop a new process and policy for employees returning back to the workforce. We're looking at doing alternate shifts to limit employees in office, work from home until end of year or till a solution has come, uh, cleaning protocols, believe it or not, in 
in your offices? Are you moving to uh, get um, purification systems and things like that? Uh, the last one is wearing masks in the office or workplace. And is that becoming the new policy? And if so, uh, will your company be providing those masks for you? Um, the last one is a little interesting. It's been a hot topic across geographic locations, and that's the temperature check uh, when returning to work. Is it voluntary or mandatory? And is it in compliance with your organization? Um, the, some of the questions that have been coming, and I really kind of take it, it pose this question to the group and everyone listening is, what's the policy if you do have a temperature higher than the approved number? Um, and are you sending that person home? Is that clear in your policy? Um, are you asking them to work from home or are they using a sick day? Um, you know, for the U.S., you want to be, again, very careful from a legality perspective, not to uh, record any medical information that a person was had a temperature of a certain number, because then that rolls into what we call HIPAA for the U.S. And the last but not least is social distancing. Believe it or not, we've actually created policies and talk with other competitor companies in regards to what is social distancing in the office now look like. Um, individual office is a very safe place and it's a great easy win, but what about those employees in spaces like call centers, open workstation, production, manufacturing, or distribution center? What are the new policies that you and your organizations are really thinking through to develop for that? And as we look at these three hot topics of, of policies uh, that we're now creating, uh, the communication is, is, is key. It's clear, consistent, and we update it and then deliver it through multiple channels, uh, whether that's company email, text, WhatsApp, social media groups, uh, and make sure that managers are cascading these new policies and new HR terms to everyone. But also, while managers are cascading the communication down, it's not only um, that policy, but it should also be checking in on employees and their well-being. When we when we talked during the week, the lessons that you've learned on the globe, you know, the fact yeah. that this started out in the Far East and is coming yeah. westward. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you've how you've used that information to plan forward? Absolutely. And, you know, that's been a, a great point. We've really used um, from our APAC region since they are now reopened what policies and things work best. We also understand there's cultural differences, right? Uh, what works best over in Asia might not be the best uh, scenario for the U.S. or from a legality perspective, it might not work as well. Um, some of those new policies are really um, open to change in certain markets where, where employees are open to this new, new life and new way of working, where in certain markets you're going to have a little resistance. And I think the final conversation that I would like to explore with is the one around your brand and and we talked a little bit didn't we about the customer experience given some of the high profile brands that you've got do you want to talk a little bit about how you might be supporting protecting i don't know re-energizing the brand around covid19 you know when we look at our brand here we're definitely in the luxury space so we're, we're looking at how do we continue to keep that experience with the customer but also keep them safe both customer and employee uh, and we're doing some things like curbside uh, delivery. So not only our e-commerce piece, which obviously you can order online and receive in the mail, but also more so where you can order and literally pick up curbside outside the store without having to come inside and be in a more crowded environment. Um, but once you're in the store, there's a few things that we're doing. We're removing some fixtures and things from the table so people are touching. Um, and then the other piece is uh, the filtration in the air systems that we're looking at for our customers as well as our employees. Any learns that, that international organizations are having. Um, yes. And I completely agree with you about networking and bringing in the legal experts, because this is unprecedented. We don't know what's coming down the track. Um, yeah. And certainly my observations around you know, disability and discrimination are at the forefront of my mind in terms of ensuring you support everybody, um, but on a very individual, on a very individual basis. Um, thank you, yes. Anthony. That's great.
Thank you. Fiona, um, please help me understand professional isolation. It's a term that up until now was new to me, um, but I know that you've been doing quite a lot of work in that in that space. So perhaps you'd just like to explore the concept and, and some do's and maybe some don'ts that you would recommend. Sure. And I wish I had a magic wand for everybody <laughs> uh, to fix this problem because it is an issue. And we're all going to, I suppose, have a different coping mechanism when it comes to professional isolation. The first thing is we have to be aware of our personality because, you know, introverts are more suited to work from home. Fact. And there's a lot of academia to back that up. Um, that's not to say extroverts can't work from home. I'm a full blown extrovert and I've worked from home for years. But what we need to do is you need to put certain adaptations in in order for that to happen. So we need to manage our energy a lot differently to introverts because we're more prone to isolation because we get our energy from people. So that's the first thing I would say is know your personality type. And it's very easy to find that out because you probably know it quite well. You don't have to take a personality test to know that. So that's what you need to check. And then you need to be checking in with your energy levels every single day. So three times a day, I'm saying to people, check in mid-morning, mid-afternoon and in the evening time. How are you feeling? If you're feeling drained and exhausted every single day and you're drinking coffee and taking your exercise and vitamins, there's something wrong with your energy. And if you're extroverted, that means you haven't had enough social interaction. So you need to get on more calls, maybe with um, friends and family, just as much as work. So it's not just work. It's in terms of your overall life at the moment. And if an introvert is feeling quite drained, they've had too much. So I'm saying more than three video calls for an introvert is after that, it's too much. So if you're having a lot of those calls, you need to taper them back or you need to switch to audio. So they're more of the kind of the day to day things we need to be mindful of on a more longer strategic thing. There's three things that are academically and, you know, in a practitioner context, proven to minimize professional isolation from an organization perspective. Number one is down to continuous learning. And I know Amanda is probably going to weigh in on some of these points, too, from her role in L&D. So what I mean by this is now is not the time to cut training and development, providing obviously organizations have the, the money still left to do that at the moment. I understand if it's a budgetary thing, it's a budgetary thing. But if there is still money there to help people continuous learning and some sort of education and even if it's not work related I have a friend at the moment who's st studying to be a yoga teacher nothing to do with work but she's tapping into something else it's, it's a challenge right now so if you're learning something new it's known to minimize professional isolation the second thing is networking and personally from my perspective I've been able to have so many virtual cups of coffee with people I never would have the time to do because I'm in the wrong location or I'm out teaching in a classroom so networking not just within your organization but outside your organization outside your sector if needs be getting back in touch with people you used to work with going on LinkedIn and connecting with people and having that chat and conversation that's another thing proven to reduce professional isolation and it also promotes a lot more camaraderie, idea generation, solidarity, all that kind of stuff, especially if you're working in an organization that doesn't probably promote that from a cultural sense. So that's number two. Um, and that's a, that's 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 a really key one um, in terms of that. Um, and I'm trying to think is rather kind of few bits of pieces that might help during the day as well with isolation. I guess the other thing to remember is that um, resilience is a very important part of isolation, too. If you're naturally resilient, you're not going to suffer as much in isolation. If you are less resilient, it's going to be a, a, a bit more of a problem, isn't it? Because you're, you're more prone to being a bit more negative. And if you're more negative, you're going to get into that negative space and you're going to be more prone to isolation as well. The other thing to mention is if you've lots of children at home or lots of people at home in general, you're, there's going to be less isolation because you have more stimulation around you uh, in terms of time. But the recharge element is really important that you're plugging yourself into recharge and you know yourself if you need more isolation. If you're a leader in the organization or in HR, um, then you have to be mindful that there's a responsibility for the individual just as much as there is a responsibility for the organization. You have to empower the individuals to kind of put their hand up and say, I need a little bit more help, um, you know, in, in, in terms of that. You know, one of the questions we were asked by the floor was around leadership and what leadership attributes um, are important whilst we're working in this virtual world i think i think for me one of the takeouts that i've been really conscious of is role modeling the behaviors 
that I'd like to see others do and, and, and taking time out from the day and not making excuses for a puppy that's in the background here that may or may not be making any noise um, yeah. because he's a newbie in the house. I wonder if you've got any thoughts about that piece around leadership and what they should be demonstrating um, Absolutely. during this period. Absolutely. And sorry, just before I go on to that, the third thing I just wanted to mention was mentoring as well. Um, so remember, I mentioned three things. So professional development network and mentoring, just before I go on to that um, question. So mentoring, it's now again, not the time to give up a mentoring program if you have one in place, because mentoring is known to really help during this time. And some people will have a little bit more time to do that as well. So just to mention that too. Go back to your question about leadership. I think the whole word at the moment is authentic leadership and really being authentic. As you said, Susan, a dog in the background. I have a small daughter. I had to put her on a call recently, a couple of calls, and I wasn't, I, I couldn't apologize because I've no no way of dealing with this. So it's just about being authentic. I know um, I have a couple of friends working in tech companies, a similar thing, all their kids are under five and their leaders were reading stories to their children in a meeting to quieten them down. And they're embracing that. So I think it's leading from the top. And unfortunately, any leadership team can be invisible at any point in time, can't they? But now is not the time. They have to be really visible. They have to be really in front of it. They have to be really promoting what's acceptable. Um, in, in a lot of HR world, we use the, in Ireland, I know we use the word reasonable accommodation when it comes to disability and equality. I'm now really resurfing this term in terms of right now with COVID. Are we reasonably accommodating people given their circumstances at home from a leadership perspective? Are we really saying it's okay if you can't do a full work day? So I think that real authentic, being real, um, value-driven leadership is exceptionally important right now from the floor which is about the introverts that you referenced um yep. have you got any tips for managers when managing people that perhaps come from a more introverted yep. um characteristic yeah absolutely the, the absolute one one tip 101 is not to put them on the spot OK, and um, you don't do that when you're in a physical meeting. Unfortunately, we tend to do that when we're virtual because we're conscious they're not in front of us. So introverts will talk when they're ready. The worst thing we can do is put them on the spot. Extroverts don't mind. They love being on the spot. Um, but with introverts, we need to give them the time to think. So if we're doing a meeting and we've got extroverts and introverts in the meeting, I'll often say I'm going to come around to everybody. So you're giving them notice. You have to give introverts notice that you're coming to ask them something, especially in a virtual type meeting. And I think the danger is introverts will suffer from more professional isolation because they're more likely to hide behind a computer because it's easier to do that. And people will talk over introverts all the time. So as a leader and manager, especially in meetings, we need to make sure that we are the balance is there introverts aren't getting excluded and they're getting an opportunity to talk i encourage a lot of introverts to use the chat function when they're in meetings because you can't shout over a chat function you can shout over a person so things like that to make sure so inclusion is a thing and anthony mentioned that as well inclusion so inclusion is personality as well yeah do you want to add anything to the professional isolation piece yeah, absolutely. And more from a team, and I just echo everything Fiona said, as people don't believe me, but I'm a natural introvert. So it's really interesting to me. I can now notice, thank goodness to exec coaching, if something is off with me, it is because I have not taken the time I need to, you will not believe this in this scenario, that I haven't taken time to be on my own, in that I am now more available to everyone, to my family, to my friends, rightly so to my team members who I have a deeper relationship now than I ever did before and I'm so grateful for that but there is now no off button and as a senior leader and I've got a bit that we might talk on on role models later I have to live and role model what behaviors we expect so I think in terms of professional isolation is leaders and in companies for me it's all about meaningful connection and genuinely seeing people they need to be they need to feel seen they need to feel trusted and they need to feel heard and valued so it's with taking into account your team members and flexing your style to them it is communicate 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 but exactly what fiona says there's actually i really like people to be able to go away and think oh i might do that so i just noted down a few things that we've done as a firm individually and i call them the small big things because they're really small and they cost no money but they're really big in terms of engagement and how people feel. 
So the small big things are on your calls or again, choose the right medium. Maybe it's a phone call from an introvert or definitely, which I never did before, the instant messaging system. So on any calls, I would always start by asking a general personal question, but be really genuine. And don't, it's Fiona's point, do not push people, but some people will want to open up. Genuinely listen. After your call, rate yourself. It should be 70% listening, 30% talking. It is something I'm very much working on. Uh, but afterwards, just, just note, and when you're listening, what are you listening for? Are you hearing what they need? Are you really hearing what their wants are? What is not being said? So really be present on your calls. And I always now finish up by asking genuinely, how can I support you better? It, all of our interactions are about meaningful connections. So the small big things, you might want to try handwritten cards. I am still taken aback by the phone calls I got from writing genuine handwritten cards. The, the 101 in terms of motivating your team is being a genuine appreciation. So it, it has to be personalized. Why are you thanking someone and their sense of purpose? How is that contributing to how you're able, able to deliver? So you, it sounds small, but it's a really big thing. Maybe a handwritten card. I had the same instant messaging system. Every two days, I will just on, we have Jabber, I know you all have different things, just send a message on uh, on the instant messaging. It's a lot more informal, you can check in and you'd be surprised how an emoji thanking someone can make someone feel. We've all spoken about it, virtual coffees. We, we're missing out on our water cooler conversations. I think that role modeling piece, Susan, that you picked out is that puts a break in the diary and senior leadership are putting it in there. So that has an impact. Now, having worked in a global organization across 12 jurisdictions, this will not suit everyone, perhaps more some than others, the virtual G&T and the virtual cocktail hour. I might be having one this evening with the team. You obviously need to make sure that you say sparkling water. You can do it with a lighthearted way, but it's a really, really nice way after work day, completely subject to do they have children? Have they got care responsibilities? With no pressure, that well. Um, and just, I'm trying to keep it easy for people because we all have our day jobs and extra programs, but you're doing lots of this already. So think as a firm what you already do and can you transfer that? So one thing we've done brilliantly at uh, Burn Wallace is over Easter, we always have a competition where the children do an art piece of artwork and they win prizes. So we made sure we did that virtually. And then what marketing and HR did was send out every single participant a treat afterwards. So, and another one was, um, they have beer and pizza. Again, culturally, you have to see what fits uh, on payday. So what that company did was they sent small delivery vouchers. So everyone as a company could have their beer and pizza together on the same payday. So just think about it. you're already doing great things. How can you recycle them and how can you turn them around? So two things, don't underestimate the impact of your meaningful conversation. It can transform someone's day and that goes into performance. And thankfully, as Fiona said, L&D has no bigger role to play ever. I am a mentor, I'm a mentee, I'm a coach and I'm a coachee. I would be struggling right now without those relationships and I also include the professional relationships in those. And later we might go on to those, but you can actually introduce most of those virtually cost-free apart from your time. Although I would say, if you have finance, even a small amount for exec coaching, your leaders are responsible for 50% of the performance of your team. If you have some leaders who normally and naturally will be in slight overwhelm and might be contracting and withdrawing slightly and not noticing they're doing it, an exec coach will get them to turn adversity into an opportunity. So even if you have a smaller budget, you will never get a higher return on investment than through exec coaching. And just know that through internal coaching and mentoring, which you can implement even if you're in cost containment, and please email myself, myself and I know Fiona's got some uh, great stuff on this as well. We can actually give you a few ideas how to do that quickly and swiftly. So all about meaningful conversations. Thank you. I think reading some of the comments that are coming through from the, the panel, there's a piece in here about well-being and a piece around resilience. So again, echoing Fiona, where you started around that professional isolation piece and, and ensuring that 
um, resilience is part of the toolkit that we develop. I have to say, I too have used the Wellbeing Company, which has been noted. I'm just about to roll out the five pillars that they have into the company that I currently work with. And I'm really looking forward to the team engaging in it, actually, and, and, and using it as a really useful diagnostic to help support people on an individual basis. So maybe we should just talk a little bit about well-being. Um, and Anthony, you've been quiet for a little while, so maybe you want to talk to us a little bit about some of the well-being initiatives that you've brought in, and then we'll spread it around the panel, if that's okay. Yeah, I sure will. So there's a few things. So obviously we have our, in the US, we have our uh, EAP or employee assistant programs, but more specifically to COVID-19, we've now rolled out uh, external uh, counselors available for all of our employees, um, whether if it's uh, depression, how to manage uh, isolation, they're available for our employees now. So this is an additional service that we've rolled out globally. So whether if it's uh, people from manufacturing, call center, again, retail, corporate, even if you've returned back to work and you still feel isolated uh, in the office and you feel like you need to speak to a professional just in how to manage um, the responsibility, juggling this new schedule, uh, we now have that available for our employees. You've, you've all given us a few ideas around how you're supporting the team. Are there others that are more specific around well-being? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, again, I just want people to go away with, if you're on course containment, the one thing I would recommend, and we've got all our managers uh, doing, is the employee assistant programs, brilliant. Exec coaching, internal coaching, mentoring really helps. But take a look at a website called thriveglobal.com. I signed, and it's, this is so helpful for managers because we are under pressure and it's the simple things. So every Wednesday, it sends me a really impactful email. And thriveglobal.com is about well being, not burning out, and sustaining performance. It's really interesting. It's from the employer and employee perspective. And how I use that, and all of our managers at Burn Wallace are using it as well, is it prompts me to read through. There was a really good article recently on. What can you do to protect and strengthen your mental health during this crisis? And so I sent it to my team and I said, oh, I'm really good on these, but I'm struggling on these. What resonates with you? And what that did is, and we do that every, and they don't know, so don't tell them, that I deliberately go through and do this each week. And it keeps mental health and well-being on the agenda. It's that role modeling and shows that we really endorse and believe in it. And then what we do at our team meetings is we would often ask them, so it's, it takes five minutes of your day and it really, really mainstreams it. So I really would check out thriveglobal.com and it'll also prompt you for lots of small initiatives. So this is the thing for L&D is what can we do now to have an immediate impact to help our people? Resilience. I might have used one of Fiona's pieces on LinkedIn the other day and flipped onto our team, which is excellent, is there is an immediate ROI on resilience, let alone what it does for people. It's and Fiona would have a much better definition, but it's essentially adapting to uh, challenge really quickly. And that's what we all need to be able to do right now. If you look at executiveinstitute.ie, they have a really good bank of L&D seminars. Again, they're free, so you can push those out and use them in departmental meetings. And they had a good seminar. It's a very introductory level, so you can watch it on resilience. And this is my resilience wheel from earlier this week. And once you've actually done it, in, and that's why I can, you know, Susan, when you roll it out, it really, really learnt. it makes a difference and it makes your businesses more profitable whilst helping your people. So for me, it's the absolute perfect blend. So I'd say have a look at that webinar and also that provider is gifting some programs to corporates. So I definitely would look at that. So thriveglobal.com. I think uh, resilience, but also for me, this is something that I'm professionally quite challenged by. My background is corporate lawyer, 100 hour weeks, coffee, don't need sleep. And for me, it's actually a huge blessing in disguise in that I'm a role model. People learn 70% from what they see around them. So it forces me to have good behaviors. So now I'm the one, and I have to stick to this. I have to schedule the coffee breaks. I have to, if we're in dialogue, I'm like, uh, by the way, I'm just going out for a walk today. You have to be the change that you wish to see. So in a way, it is 
been a, I've always been and our firm is outstanding on the well-being piece and um, our HR would have monthly well-being we'd always have something we've got now 2k runs at lunchtime and we all check in with each other and things but this has been challenging me to me personally and it's something that is really helping me and holds me accountable so they would be my tips would be get the results for everyone check thriveglobal.com and hold yourself accountable you can't it can't be be what i say not as i do you know you have to be leading from the front here <laughs> absolutely it's like, like me and i think the thing i'd add to your resourcing oops it's all gone a bit crackly anyway the things i'd add to your resourcing pack believe it or not is the .gov.uk current website the advice they have about keeping your workplace safe because i think one of the big concerns for people right now is anxiety and the anxiety is the unknown and, and knowing and being reassured that your employer is doing all they can to keep you safe. So I think there's toolkits for you as an individual. And then there's a obvious evidence that your employer is putting the employees first and foremost through those risk assessments around what will it mean for me coming back into back into work. On that note, Anthony, we've had a request around the counselling package that you talked about. Um, and, and actually, how does that internal resource work? So it was it was it was a global uh, conversation that we had to have with each region because remember there's language uh, differences in each region, et cetera. So we had to select the right uh, external vendor. So we've selected I think about four to five for to support each region, and it's more so like an eight hundred number. But it's I've used it once just to try it. Um, just to make sure it's not a, like a call center person just kind of randomly picking up the phone. It's, what are you experiencing? Are you in the home alone? What is your work day like? Are you out able to take a walk and be out? And then what are you feeling? Um, and I am here in Paris by myself and alone with no gym, et cetera. So, you know, those it was a good kind of relief. Um, to speak to someone. However, if the concerns were, were more serious, you know, it's the service is there to share that. And then there's some next steps for those individuals. And not only, and I can share, each counseling um, a psychologist program vendor that we've used is different by, by region. But then there's some things that we've done even as a, a global organization. So um, the yoga piece, we send that out every Monday, and it's a video of different poses stretches. There's also a, uh, because restaurants were only doing delivery here in Paris, we were doing some um, cooking links for people to prepare meals. And then the third one was an education to help uh, parents with their students, giving them the resources to their local markets. So our, each of our HRVs in each market was coming us back to, to Global Here, sharing with us their resources. So we were making sure we were communicating that out to all of our employees in that region. I think the homework uh, for parents uh, had been the biggest response that we were, they were glad they were able to receive that because they were like, I've been a professional, I haven't been a student in years, and this is new math. And parents were kind of like, how do I support my, my, my children at home with their homework while I'm still managing my day-to-day -day responsibility at work? So, so those were the three things that we did, but the counseling was separate. But the things that we did as a company directly was the, the yoga, the cooking links, and the last one was the, um, the homework helpline. Brilliant. Thank you. Fiona, I think you'd like to make a couple of comments around the well-being and resilience piece. Just something small, and I think it's worth um, commenting. I have to quote Bono from you too, by the way, because he had a lovely quote this week where he said, we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. And I absolutely <laughs> love that because yeah. what that means is that we all have different scenarios going on. And a resilience approach is not a one size fits all because some of us have this in buckets and some of us are really low on it. And resilience as a word is getting thrown around a lot. It doesn't mean confidence. It doesn't mean that, you know, there's lots of different meanings behind it. So I think going back to the discussion we had on being an authentic leader, I think the leaders and managers really need to have some sort of ownership this in some regard. It's up to the individual, of course, but the manager is the first person that's going to notice if something's off. 
and back to my lovely thesis that I have to quote um, a big part of that was the relationship with the manager was so crucial and I'm talking about your immediate manager or even if you've got a good relationship with a skip level manager as well but the manager is going to be the first person to know what's going on and take that pulse on somebody so I think we have to just kind of remember that that they're going to know if something's off that's all I wanted to add no no worries I think I think then the final discussion topic was about employee engagement and, and how you invest, particularly when some organizations, you know, less is less is more actually. Um, and looking at that bottom line and safeguarding jobs will be at the forefront of people's minds. So Amanda, I think you wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of investment and, and the engagement around employees. And then Anthony, I thought I'd yeah. hand over to you about the commercial reality of it all, because um, you need to balance both. <laughs> And, and I know Fiona's got some uh, points in here as well, which will really help. Uh, I think people are quite fortunate in that the landscape has changed here because people now get that, and companies, that people and engagement, is they're the absolute cornerstones of our, of our companies. But we are in a unprecedented situation. So if you haven't looked at the stats, you need to know your business case inside out. I'm going to give you a couple, but if you literally Google um, employee engagement and ROI, there are beautiful infographics, but it really is as simple as employ engaged employees make your company 21% more profitable. We all need to make more money right now. Although we're about our people, ultimately, it's about the bottom line. Errors. Disengaged people make 60% more mistakes. So whether that's getting the sales wrong through the beautiful handbag that's going through, or if it's a decimal point, if you're a fund manager, you cannot have disengaged employees, 60% higher mistakes. Engaged companies outperform, so in terms of performance, by 202%. So know your stats and your data. It is, it is, it is really, really simple in that also right now, we need the people, you need your people performing right now for your clients. There is no better client service then client then employee engagement if you have disengaged employees you're going to have service and we will come out the other side and we want our talent and our people who are doing everything they can right now to be engaged on the other side they i love the mayor angelou quote people will not remember what you said they will not remember what you did but they will remember the way you made them feel and whilst that feels very touchy feely if hopefully we have the Nike curve. Depending on how you treated them, they will stay or go on the other side. So I know we have to be focused on immediate impact, but we also need to be looking at our talent right now and our talent going forward. So number one, hopefully, and most companies get this, employee engagement, HR, and L&D, the ROI, it, it just goes without saying. Now, the commercial realities, which I'll go really quickly on because I, I think we need to be realistic here. As business leaders, you always align your strategy to the business objectives. Right now, the business objectives have changed. What is immediate impact? And if you have temporary cost containment, what are the simplest things you can do to make an impact on your people and performance? So the, the best things that you can do are purpose, communicate engagement. If you just share what your company's missions and values are and are, your engagement will go through the roof. Also, uh, a lot of people are doing employee engagement surveys. I have done a complete 180 on these thanks to working with the head of culture with MUFG who, my goodness, she lives the cultures and values. It will give you a touch point on really what's going on in your company. And we like to, as a manager, I know exactly what's going on in my team, but we're disconnected. So what an employee engagement survey does is you can say, we listened and this is how we're responding. Numerous providers are doing them for free right now. Uh, an incredible provider that I use is called Invisio. So maybe check out Louise McNamara there. So, so you've got your, communicate your purpose, do and respond to an employee engagement survey, get in touch with your providers. Mine have been incredible. Two weeks before lockdown, they got all of our senior leadership on a Zoom call, which was literally unheard of for them back at the time. We did two workshops on leading virtual work, uh, teams and they did it on a really incredible basis for us. So utilize those relationships. Use the people you've met today. There is together, there is nothing we haven't been through before apart from 
the, the slight pandemic we have. But in terms of we've done more with less before. We have been through a recession before and we know how to make an impact. So please, you are not an island. Reach out to any of us, reach out through the IITD or CIPD. And I want to go through really quickly because Anthony's got some great points here, but more free stuff. Go to the executiveinstitute.ie and look at their leadership and management webinars. They're bi-weekly and they're really good. So what you can do there is push that out to your managers so they can lead, and then you can have conversations around that. Thrive Global notifications we've spoken about. HBR management tips of the day. These are little free gems. They are 30 second reminders that we have going out to all of our heads of department and to HR. And they just remind you of really good management tips and they'll give you inspiration as well. My favorite one last week, which we all need, is how to answer the unanswerable question. If anyone doesn't need that right now, I don't know who does. And then fourthly is LinkedIn content. There is stuff there, Fiona's stuff. I'm rec There's a video on authentic leadership that I just sent around and I got so, it, it just opened up a conversation, was invaluable. Also, remember your existing programs. You've probably got a brilliant mentoring program, coaching program, really good leadership program. It doesn't have to be shiny. You don't need the infographic or the perfect tagline. Pull out what they need right now, repackage it and help them. So that would be another suggestion. I think just overall is that we have the opportunity in HR engagement and in L&D to really take people from that contracting overwhelm into overcoming together. We, we really can do this. So I think the other thing that it does, it gives people a sense of focus a sense of hope and a sense of belief and through that engagement comes through and I think when people feel that it makes such a difference in terms of performance and engagement so don't be afraid of having less we you can do so much more with less and with all of us together we can absolutely come through it and it's actually at Burn Wallace it's accelerated our programs and don't get me wrong it has taken energy and enthusiasm but we've launched so much more stuff impactfully the phone calls I'm having so you can do it. Thank you, Amanda. Fiona, just a, a couple of things have come through in the questions. One is, is your dissertation being published? And if it isn't, how do they get hold of it? Um, and, a second, and a second question actually about having talked about professional isolation um, and we're now talking about investment, your thoughts about that engagement piece? Oh, Fiona, I think we've lost. The mic. Um, so first of all, my thesis was published with the university, but it's not available publicly because a lot of the organizations that I studied wanted confidentiality applying. However, um, feel free if you want to follow me on LinkedIn, because I've actually taken a lot of bite sized sections from the thesis and wrote a lot of articles and I'm doing a lot of videos on it. So Amanda is uh, often on it, uh, the profile in terms of there's plenty there free available on that profile if you do want to uh, link up that way. Uh, Asian piece, I really echo a lot with, with what Amanda is saying. There's an awful lot of um to just be at your disposal that's free and easy and you know doesn't cost a lot of money and um, remember with engagement a lot of people are feeling uncertain at the moment so if we can try and get ahead of that that's really going to help there's a lot of people wondering are they going to have a job in a couple of months time and that's you know the big headache i think at the moment because there's a, a big link between engagement and that feeling of uncertainty so if we can try and get ahead with as many organization communications as possible to allay some of the fears we can't do it all but lay some of the fears i think that's going to be a link that we can find of help as well and also back to that whole reasonable accommodation that we're trying to help with with our employees and um, there's a lot of people feeling they have a psychological guilt factor at the moment which people do suffer for when they work on their own is to work harder and longer just in case they might lose their job they don't want their head to be on that chopping block so they're working longer and harder telling the, the guys we don't need to work like that at the moment so i think again it's back to the leaders it's back to the positioning and it's back to make sure there's a link between the strategy strategy to help them feel engaged. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, for those that can't see the, the chat box, if you're doing some free engagement pulse surveys, and Amanda has very kindly said that if you get in touch with her via LinkedIn, she'll share some of the freebies that she's been talking about, about today. Anthony, a final word from you as we begin to wrap this session up. Yeah, you know, I really wanted to touch back on the being authentic and the engagement piece. So some things that we've done here, too, is 
you know, our employees, they feel like the senior leaders and the presidents of the organizations are, you know, in some high castle. Um, so what it really, that touch of authenticity is usually I would encourage organizations to have their presidents and their CEOs really write a communication piece out. And you've seen a few of these videos come through from CEOs and presidents where they're even giving up salaries or their bonuses to really help the organization. But when people see that it's affecting everyone from the top to the bottom, you know, it's like we're really in this together. Um, so I would really encourage the authenticity and the communication to come from senior leaderships, your presidents and your CEOs. Um, the other thing about the communication and keeping everyone engaged, the last piece is over communicate, over communicate to your employees. They're at home, they're alone, they don't know what's really going on, they don't know what decisions are being made. So make sure the communication comes out frequently and make sure that they're accessible to all employees. You know, everyone doesn't have a work phone or work email. You have to think about the population that your, your employees are serving. So how are you getting a message to them? But you really want to make sure you over communicate and things are out in advance. Um, it's, it's just gone 10 past three. So I think we probably do need to wrap the panel up. Um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Amanda, Fiona and Anthony for your time this afternoon. And I think my final comment is that now is the time for HR people to stand up and be brave. And that will be frightening and it will challenge our resilience. And at times I'm sure it will wobble our confidence. Um, and I know that each and every one of us are very happy to talk to people um, if we can help, but we would absolutely recommend networking. Um, networking outside of your own organizations to hear and see what other people are doing. And I notice there's a networking section in this summit. So maybe that's a good place, good place to start.